All right, we're recording now, so. All right. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, yeah, I will set you as a presenter when I'm done with the, uh, with the, with the introduction, then you take the floor and. Ah, oh, awesome. So you, you, you decide when you want to take questions. You can take questions. Usually it's better if we, if we take it at the end, because mm -hmm. that way it doesn't interrupt that much for all of you. I muted you because. If I don't mute you, then people forget to mute, and then we hear the dogs and the kids and everything. So, so if you if you really need to talk, then just uh, put it in the chat, and uh, and if you have a a question, put it in the chat. We'll address it. So, uh, guys, this is probably our last meetup uh, where we're gonna have uh, some sort of a formal presentation. Uh, we have one month more in December. I hope all of you guys are safe and things are probably looking up. I hope so, truly. Um, and uh, if you were here before, I was just talking to uh, Respeto about the, the outlook. It doesn't look like um, uh, things are gonna get better anytime soon for going back into personal meetings. So uh, you can you can check this year out. Uh, we're not gonna go back to in-person meetings, in fact, there is closings again, um, and uh, we'll have to see what's going to happen. Um, we do intend to have a online um, sort of a meeting or event that will have competitions, and this will be done for our last uh, event of the year. And hopefully, this will be uh, something you can have fun and, and we make it interactive, make it. I was thinking maybe may doing like a, a combination of a Discord and a Twitch channel. Um, for those who are not in Discord, uh, I will post the Discord invite in the chat. Uh, today we had Eviatar uh, from the Akamai security research team, and he's gonna talk to us about an introduction to EOK. EOK is the most popular uh, open source um, framework for log analytics and many other stuff. Um, so, uh, keep in touch, uh, join the discord and we'll be announcing soon. Um, what we're going to do. So with, with that, I'm going to make. A VTR presenter and you can take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rod. Uh, so yeah, uh, let me just share my screen real quick. Uh. There we go. Can you uh, can you guys see my screen? Okay. I don't see it yet. No. Okay. How about now? Mm hmm. Excellent. Awesome. And uh, can you guys also hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're good to go, man. Great. Um, so yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, like I say, it's very good to be here today. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Evitor Sayas. Uh, like Rod said, I'm a security researcher and a software engineer. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a technology stack called the Elk Stack, uh, which is a very popular tech stack for handling all kinds of uh, log data, uh, like honeypot logs, PCAPs, malware signatures, all kinds of analysis reports, uh, and many more types of logs um, that we often uh, use. Uh, I want to start off uh, by looking at the agenda for today. Um, this is the first uh, part of the agenda. Uh, so first, we are going to briefly talk about the classic Elk stack uh, and what it is. Uh, then I will introduce the custom Elk stack uh, that we're going to be setting up here today. Um, so what I mean by a custom Elk stack, uh, basically uh, we are going to be replacing the Logstash component uh, with a different technology, but we're gonna get uh, more into that uh, soon. Uh, then I will briefly talk about Docker and Docker Compose. Um, I want to just briefly touch on these uh, since we will be using Docker Compose in order to set up our Elk stack. Uh, I want this to be more of a practical presentation. Uh, so we're going to actually set up the Elk stack together and interact with it and explore uh, some of its uh, most popular features. Uh, after we finish setting up our, um, our Elk stack, our custom Elk stack, um, we're going to explore each component of our custom Elk stack individually. Uh, these are the 
components that will make up our stack, um, Elasticsearch, Kibana, Celery, uh, and RabbitMQ, uh, which we're going to talk about uh, very soon. Um, and then uh, we're going to push uh, some data into our functional pipeline uh, and see how all these components work together uh, and see how this type of setup can be very useful and effective uh, for a security professional uh, as far as analysis and handling large uh, volumes of data. Um, and then finally, at the end, we're going to have some, uh, some Q&A time. Okay. All right, so uh, so let's dive right into it. Um, what is the classic ELK? So ELK is an acronym for three open source uh, projects, um, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Um, Elasticsearch is a searching analytics engine. Um, you can also think of it as a full text uh, distributed NoSQL database um, that scales very well. Um, Logstash is a server-side data processing pipeline that ingests data uh, from multiple sources uh, simultaneously, transforms it, uh, and then sends it to a stash uh, like Elasticsearch. Um, Logstash is usually used for data enrichment um, and usually acts as the middleman between Elasticsearch and uh, an input source. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have Kibana uh, that lets users uh, visualize the data with charts and graphs and that kind of stuff. You can think of Kibana as basically a, a front end for your Elasticsearch data. Uh, it can also be used to create custom dashboards and some cool uh, visuals. Uh, it makes analyzing large uh, amounts of data much easier and more uh, effective. And we're going to look at all the features uh, very soon. Uh, so that's the classic ELK stack. Um, I want to quickly also talk about the need for ELK in security. So security professionals um, often find themselves uh, needing to work with high volumes of uh, log data. Uh, and the ability to quickly search, store, and visualize logs at scale, uh, and the key here is really at scale, uh, because it's usually a lot of logs, um, can make analysis easier and more effective. Uh, just to list a few examples of common logs that we might want to ingest into this uh, pipeline. Um, logs from a compromised machine, if we're doing any type of analysis or trying to find any type of uh, exploit that was used. Um, PCAPs uh, make them searchable. Um, honeypot logs, uh, analysis reports, um, malware signatures. Any types of, uh, we usually in, in, in the security world, we use a lot of different tools and stuff. Uh, it, it's very useful to have all those tools fit into that same dashboard, uh, keep them in a centralized place. Um, also, maybe some, some system performance data like CPU spikes, uh, memory consumption data, all kinds of uh, logs like that. Um, so I mentioned briefly before uh, that we're going to be using a custom ELK stack. Uh, in, our, in, in our case, uh, we will not be using Logstash, like I said. Instead, we'll be replacing Logstash with two other technologies uh, called Celery and RabbitMQ uh, for data enrichment. Uh, basically, we want to make this scale. This is going to help us out a lot. Um, this will allow us to scale better uh, using a distributed worker queue, uh, which is what Celery is. It will also provide us with more visibility and greater control over our pipeline. So a bit more about scaling. Um, Celery is a distributed uh, task queue um, for Python. Um, it uses distributed workers in order to consume tasks from a queue. And just uh, a little bit about what I mean by distributed workers. Um, basically, you can have an entire server and all of its resources just dedicated to running workers. You can have multiple services, uh, servers, sorry, uh, ser uh, servers, boxes. You can run uh, workers on, on, on many of those uh, at once. And just have all those um, consumed from the same queue so they can work together. So you can kind of see where the scaling aspect comes in. Um, so like I said, in our case, uh, the, um, uh, we're going to be using Celery and RabbitMQ. Uh, RabbitMQ is actually a message broker. It's going to be maintaining our queue. It's a very popular message broker. And actually, Celery was originally designed to use this specific message broker. Um, uh, it can also now, of course, support other, other ones, like another popular one is Redis. Uh, but we're going to be using uh, uh, RabbitMQ. 
So um, this type of setup is going to allow us to uh, scale nicely since Celery can also increase or decrease uh, the number of workers that it uses uh, based on the load dynamically. So that's pretty cool. Um, and RabbitMQ can also act as a buffer. So for example, if our Elasticsearch goes down or whatever is feeding uh, the logs to our pipeline, in our case, we're going to set up a little custom honeypot, but uh, whatever is feeding the um, the pipeline goes down or any of that stuff. Uh, basically, those messages messages are not going anywhere. They're going to be on Rabbit MQ, uh, and once everything is back and up and running, uh, it will be consumed. So that's a nice thing as well. Um, so yeah, um, this kind of setup is also going to provide us with more visibility into our pipeline. Um, since Celery enables us to use a tool called Flower as well. Uh, it works with Celery. Uh, it's just a simple web UI, basically, uh, that helps us monitor our uh, Celery, uh, Celery workers. Um, so Flower is going to allow us to see if workers failed or succeeded, how long it took workers to complete their tasks. Maybe we can debug or optimize. Uh, and we'll be able to identify any issues with our pipeline uh, if logs do not make it all the way to Elasticsearch in the end. Uh, we're going to have a lot of visibility to errors and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Celery and RabbitMQ more in depth uh, very soon. Uh, but that's RabbitMQ and Celery for now. And that's the reason we're going to replace Logstash with those. Um, all right. So just to summarize, this is the custom elk stack that we're going to be building here today. Um, it's it's going to have uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, Celery, and RabbitMQ. All right, so um, before we start setting up our Elk stack, I briefly want to talk about what Docker is for those who are not familiar with it already. Um, I want to go over it because we're going to be using Docker Compose to set up our stack. So um, here on the slide, I have the formal definition from Wikipedia. I'll read it very quickly. Um, Docker is a set uh, of platform as a service products that use OS level virtualization to deliver software and packages called containers. Uh, containers are isolated from one another and bundle their own software libraries and configuration files. They can communicate with each, with each other through a well-defined channels. And here is the place where you would install Docker from. Um, so I'm going to highly oversimplify this definition and maybe butcher it uh, just a little bit. Um, Docker has many benefits, uh, but to keep it simple, what you basically need to know for the sake of our example um, is that Docker is a tool that allows you to run services in sandbox-like environments called containers. So you can pre-configure these containers, like for example, setting up environmental variables uh, or installing any dependencies that your server uh, that your service uh, might need to run in order to uh, uh, to function properly. Um, this basically ensures that um, your service has all the configurations uh, it needs in order to run properly on any system. Um, there are many uh, more benefits to Docker uh, and the concepts of isolating services, uh, 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 isolating services from one another uh, provides a lot of value. Um, I can basically go on and on about Docker um, and how beneficial uh, service isolation is, but for the sake of our example, that's all you really need to know. It's also worth mentioning uh, the Docker con uh, containers uh, are created from something called an image. Uh, an image can be created from something called a Docker file, uh, or it can be pulled from the Docker hub. Uh, the Docker hub is basically just a big um, image repository. Um, I'm going to quickly show how to pull an image from Docker hub. For those who don't know, uh, we're going to be using the Elasticsearch image as an example. So let me just uh, open up a new tab here. I'll go to Google real quick. And I'll search uh, Docker Hub. It should be the first thing uh, that, that comes up, uh, hub.docker.com. Finding your images on here is very simple. Uh, it's very intuitive. You just type in the name of the service that you're interested in into the search box, uh, and there's more, more, most likely an image for it. So for example, if I very quickly just want to test some bugs on the latest version of Nginx, or if I just want to uh, spin up uh, a, a web server very quickly just to test some features. Um, I can find the Nginx uh, 
uh, container just like that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, image just like that. And I will basically use this uh, image in order to create containers from. So uh, they have a bunch of cool um, images here. Nginx is just one of them. If you're inter interested in uh, Arch Linux, for example, you can type Arch in here. And there it is, Arch Linux. Uh, I bet they also have a Kali one. Uh, yeah, uh, you're interested in any any database, uh, SQL, you want to test some features, um, it's all in here. Uh, we're going to be looking at Elasticsearch. So let's search for that. And there it is. We can see it has over, let's see the actual amount, uh, 100 million downloads. So you can see how popular this service uh, is. Um, and when you click on it, uh, the nice thing is that uh, it gives you a little more information. You can actually specify which version of Elasticsearch you're interested in. So if you know there's a vulnerability in, in this particular version, but not the latest one, you want to mess with it, you can pull down the image, start playing with it. If you, um, if, if, if you, if, an, if the new version comes out and it breaks the application, you can always go back and pull the, the, the previous one. So that's nice. Um, they give you a little example as well, uh, how to actually create a container from this image. So you see here, um, they're mapping ports, they're studying environmental variables, they're putting uh, their container on their virtual network called some network. But we're going to get more into that later. Uh, the, the real interesting part is this right here, Docker pool Elasticsearch. You can copy that onto your terminal once you install Docker. And Docker will just pull this image from the Docker Hub and you'll be ready to go. You're going to have Elasticsearch image on your host machine and you can start working with it. So very simple, super awesome. I just wanted to show that real quickly. So that's it for Docker Hub. Uh, let's go back to our slides. Okay, just gonna get a sip of water real quick. All right, so uh, next, the only reason I even brought up Docker up is because I wanna set the stage for Docker Compose. So we are going to be using Docker Compose uh, to set up our Elk stack today. Um, Docker Compose is awesome. Uh, what is it? It's um, Docker Compose is a tool for defining and running multi-container Docker applications. Uh, with Docker Compose, you can use a YAML file to configure your application services. Then with a single command, uh, which is the best part, uh, you create and start all your services from your configuration. So um, it's very convenient to use Docker Compose instead of having to run multiple containers using the Docker run commands like we saw in the example on Docker Hub with the Elasticsearch. Uh, our Elk stack uses uh, about four services. Uh, it's not really that great to, to, to have four different commands to run those individual containers and keep track of them. We want to somehow link them together. Also, uh, when you run them individually, you have to make sure that they're on the same virtual network so they can talk to each other. Docker Compose takes care of that for you. If you put a service in Docker Compose, it's by default going to be on the same virtual network, Docker virtual network, as um, your other services. So it takes care of a lot of the configuration parts. So we're going to be using uh, that. So uh, let's have a look actually uh, on uh, at the YAML file that I created for Docker for our project, Docker Compose YAML uh, that we are, just talked about. Um, it looks like this. So it's called Docker Compose YAML. Uh, I know it can look a little bit intimidating if you never worked with this type of stuff before. Uh, there's a lot going on, a lot of services, but I promise you it's really easy. It's a lot more simple uh, than it looks. Uh, once you understand the basic structure and just a few keywords and syntax, uh, you'll be good to go to create your own very easily. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go over the... Um, um, I'm just quickly gonna go over the syntax here and the structure. So just like Python in the indentation matter for YAML files in general. So as you can see, this nginx keyword here is kind of indented inwards. So it's a child of services. So basically all of, uh, uh, all of uh, uh, this is uh, our service tag and everything inside of it is a service, uh, AKA it's gonna be our containers. So um, let's look at the common uh, fields that they share, all of our services. They all have an image, they have ports, they have volumes. 
Um, let's take a look at the image. So first of all, this tag right here, you can name it whatever you want. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's just the name for your image, for your container, sorry. Um, image here is the name of the image that you want Docker to pull from Docker Hub. So there's two ways to, uh, I guess, um, create containers um, from images. You can have images from Docker Hub, like I said, or you can have images, uh, create images from Docker files. So another alternative would be to specify here a path to a Docker file uh, if we want to customize this image. Uh, but we're not doing that in this example. We're taking the just the the, the image on the Docker files uh, on the Docker Hub. Sorry, um, on all of these uh, containers. So that will be the name of your image. Uh, ports. So this is port mapping. This is really handy. Uh, it basically is saying map the port on my local machine to the port inside my container. So why is it so handy? Because for in this example, I'm running Nginx in this container. This uh, Nginx is uh, listening on port 80 inside the container. So in order for me to actually hit this uh, web uh, web server, I would have to specify the IP of the container and make a GET request to it and stuff. And it gets kind of annoying because as you spin up your containers, bring them down and up, the IP may not always be the same. It's kind of annoying if you have many, many services to keep to remember all the IPs of your containers running your different services. So it's very convenient if I can just make a GET request to some port on my local machine, local host, and then have that just hit my web server on my container. So what I'm doing here, I'm just mapping port 5001 on my machine to port 80 on the container. So that's pretty cool. You can, do, you can have multiple ports mapping, by the way. Uh, next is volumes. Um, you can think of volumes as synced folders. Basically, uh, to keep it simple, a, a volume is basically just a sync folder syncing between your host and your container. It's very useful if you want to copy files from your host to the container and, and from your container to your host, uh, just transfer files. Uh, if you want, if you're writing some sort of a script that you want to actually execute inside the container, but you don't feel like SSHing into the container uh, using Vim to write your, your, your script. Uh, it's kind of a pain. You want to just write the script on your machine in your favorite editor, but you want it to just run inside the container. You can just use this volume to uh, have all of the scripts that you write in that synced folder available for your container uh, to use as well. This is actually a neat example because I'm, I want to overwrite here the, the default configuration file for my engine X. So like I said again uh, before, you can SSH into it, find the engine X config, manipulate it, but uh, I can just map the folder inside the container here to another folder here, and it will copy that config file to my host machine. So I can just override it uh, like just like that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, notice that uh, PHP FPM also has a command um, uh, field. Um, basically, you can also have, uh, it's optional, but you can also have um, Docker run any sort of command once the container uh, is up and running for you. Uh, this is not actually the, the best way to do this. This should really be happening in your Docker file. But let me just show you. I'm running here setup.sh. Um, it is right here under a honeypot. I'll go. I'll go more into detail why, how, like what this we're going to be using this services for. We're going to be using this for our honeypot to generate some logs for us. I'll get more into that later. But this is the setup file. You see, I'm just uh, once the container is up and running. I'm installing Composer. I'm changing permission, doing all that kind of stuff. I could do all that in a Docker uh, file instead. It would be better, but it's just a quick example that I put together. Um, yeah, in that case, you would just pretty much in your Docker file said from, uh, say from PHP image, uh, and then you know do everything you need to do in that Docker file, and then specify the path here to it. All right, so that's the basic structure. Uh, you see that we have many services. So let me just very quickly explain what we're going to be using those services for. You guys might be surprised to see PHP, FPM, and Nginx here because that was not originally a part of our Elk stack. But I thought it would be fun. 
um, to basically have something generate some logs for us for us to an actually analyze uh, using our elk, uh, elk stack. So I thought a honeypot might be cool. Uh, it's just going to be a simple web server. You can use any web server you like. You don't have to use Nginx or PHP FPM. You can use Apache, uh, Node.js, uh, Flask, Django, whatever framework you like for, you know, to imitate, uh, uh, mimic a, a simple honeypot. Its only job will be to log requests it receives. We're going to make some malicious requests into that web server. It's going to basically log them and then send them off to our pipeline so we can just see how everything comes together. So this is the role of the Nginx and flight uh, in PHP FPM. It's going to be our honeypot. Celery is not, it doesn't have a designated image that it's going to use. It's not going to, if you look for Celery in the Docker Hub, you're not going to find an image for that. And the reason for that is because Celery is just a simple library. You install it with the pip. You can say pip install Celery. Uh, you start off with a basic Python image. You, you install Celery. Um, you install Flower. I'll, 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 when we get to the Celery part uh, in more detail, I'll show like the, the setup scripts and stuff like that, what you need to do to get up and running. Um, Elasticsearch, uh, like we talked about, it's setting an environmental variable here, specifying this is a single node. This is just a little test. We're just going to use a single node here. Um, uh, and Kibana, uh, we're going to expose it on, on port uh, 5601. And you can see I even commented out Logstash. Uh, you can use Logstash if you like. Uh, the image is available. In fact, you can make this Docker Compose your own. You can add any service you like to this, it's very easy. It's a matter of just copy and pasting it in the same format, grabbing the image, and it's all gonna work nicely on the same Docker network. Uh, it's pretty awesome. So that's the Docker uh, Compose file. Uh, I think we are ready to start running this. So let, let's set this up. And this is actually really cool. You're gonna see this is relatively a, a complicated system. I mean, it has many services, but just with a single command, we'll be up and running in less than a minute. It's it's really cool. So let's go to a terminal real quick. Got a terminal open here. I'm already in the directory where my Docker Compose file is. It's right here. Um, you need to be in that same directory uh, to access this Docker Compose. And we're gonna run the simple command. Um, by the way, uh, um, Docker has many, uh, I want to just show you if you're ever curious about the stuff you can do with Docker, there's many, many, many features and stuff, commands. You can just run Docker, it will display all the commands for you. So let's run Docker Compose, Docker Compose up to start up our custom Elk stack. And there it is. You can see that it's trying to pull all the images from the Docker Hub. It's super fast in my case because I already have those images pulled onto my machine. So it was almost instant. But you see, it's uh, configuring all the services. It's doing everything it needs to do, configuration, setting up uh, users for Rabbit. Uh, the user is going to be guest. Password is also going to be guest. Uh, it tells you in the Docker Hub uh, page where you grab the image from, the default. Uh, it's doing all kinds of uh, tedious stuff that we don't have to do ourselves. So we're just going to give it a second to finish running. It should be very quick. All right. So it is almost done, uh, it seems like. Let's see. This is our PHP FPM working and it's ready to handle connections. That's going to be our honeypot, like I said. So that's cool. All right. Uh, and just like that, we're ready to go. Let's confirm this. Let me actually um, open a new tab in my terminal. And um, one command you can run with Docker is the PS command to list all running containers. Let's see if all of our containers are currently running. And there it is. They're all ready to go. We got a unique ID for them. This is, for example, our Elasticsearch one. We got some ID. Uh, we can see the port mapping. Everything looks great. Another little thing that I want to show you, if you're working on a Mac, uh, when you install Docker, it comes with a really cool, um, it's called Docker um, Desktop, I believe. Um, Docker Desktop. It looks like actually our engine expelled. 
to start with. There it is. Is it gonna fail? No, nah, looks good. Anyways, um, with this tool, because we use Docker Compose, it's put all of our containers under a single project. Um, green here is uh, indicating that our um, individual containers are up and running. You can see which port they're exposing. It's just, uh, I usually use the command line for more uh, complicated stuff with Docker, but just to start a container, restart it, delete it, uh, see what ports it's listening on. I, I like to use this little little front end uh, for the Mac OS. Um, you can you can even click on the individual individual um, containers. You're gonna get specific logs for that one. Um, you can, like I said, you can. You can even SSH into it from here. I don't recommend it though. Uh, you should use the execute command um, to get a better terminal. It gives you kind of an ugly terminal, but you can you can open this in a browser if this is exposing any ports. You can open it in a browser from here. You can delete it, restart it, stop it, all that kind of stuff. You can see more details about it, the path. You can see all kinds of uh, mounts, ports. Uh, you can see stats, so CPU usage, memory usage, network uh, input and output, uh, disk read and write, like all kinds of really cool stuff. So I, I like to use this little thing. Um, but anyways, it looks like we're good to go. It looks like all of our services are up and running. So uh, we have a fully functional uh, elk stack. So let's start off by exploring. Uh, let's go back to our slides here slides right here okay uh let's start exploring all the individual services um we're gonna start off with Elasticsearch. um uh let's start with some general information about Elasticsearch. um so like i previously mentioned before um elastic search is a highly scalable search and analytics engine you can also think of it as a distributed no sql database for holding all your logs um, it is super fast. It can handle really large amounts of data. You can have many nodes running Elasticsearch uh, to scale this out. You can specifically um, assign some nodes to be just pure, uh, purely data nodes, uh, and nodes and some nodes to just purely handle search uh, requests and queries. Really optimize this. Uh, you can scale all those nodes with Kubernetes as well and bring them up and down with uh, Ansible. You can really play around with this. Uh, there are many things uh, like like that that you can do to make an, a really good uh, have a really good setup uh, going. Uh, just a little bit about the endpoints. Uh, so API endpoints. Um, you can interact with Elasticsearch using an API. Uh, it makes it really easy and accessible to interact with Elasticsearch. Uh, so that's really awesome. Um, you could use curl. You could use any HTTP uh, client. Uh, I personally like to use Postman. Uh, of course, it makes it easy to interact with the code because almost any language out there has some sort of a, a HTTP library. Um, and also another thing is that Elasticsearch uses a NoSQL like like architecture. Um, if anyone here used MongoDB before or any other NoSQL database. It is a very similar in that way. Um, Elasticsearch stores uh, what's called documents into another thing uh, called index. Uh, and if we compare it to an SQL syntax, um, an index will be similar to a table in, S in the SQL uh, world. Uh, and a document will be very similar to like a row in a table, uh, which is basically an entry. So in addition, um, uh, in addition to that, um the documents have fields as well which can be compared to um sql columns so every row in sql has some columns some fields uh so that's kind of like, like the same the same concept here um also ha also uh documents have json like structure uh which makes it uh, very convenient to to interact with elasticsearch uh, since it's an api a restful api uh, so that's some general info about um, Elasticsearch. Um, so let's let's see how it works. So we have a we have an Elasticsearch setup. So let's let's play around with it a little bit. Um, uh, first thing uh, first, um, what I like to do since uh, you can interact with Elasticsearch through just basically any HTTP client, also our browser uh, just basically is making a GET request. 
Uh, let's uh, let's see if our Elasticsearch is even up and running uh, with that. So, if you remember in in my um, Docker Compose file, I exposed, I mapped port ninety two hundred on my machine to port ninety two hundred on the container that's running Elasticsearch. So I should be able to to hit with a GET request on that port uh, the Elasticsearch uh, instance. So let's let's do that from my local machine. So local host, uh, local host on this port right here. So our browser again is just making a simple get request. And there it is. I also have a neat little add-on on my Google Chrome to make this like a JSON color coded thing. So that's kind of fun. Let me increase the font so you guys can see this. Let me, let me do this. All right. So if you see this tagline, you know, for search, it means your elastic search is up and running it's working good we are ready to start playing around with it so that's awesome um i'm not going to be using just the browser for all of my http requests and hitting the npi api endpoints of elastic because i want to make some post requests and some put requests and stuff like that and it just i, I really like to use uh, a tool called postman so you're going to be using that uh, right now this is Postman for those who never used it before. It's a very awesome tool, just helps you make HTTP um, requests. You can also use curl, but I like to have a nice UI. Um, Postman also allows me to, I guess, uh, kind of save my requests also. So I prepared a few. Uh, Postman is pretty cool. I like it a lot. So the first thing that we're going to be doing with Elasticsearch is um, we're going to hit the uh, we're going to use a put request uh, here. Let me make it bigger so you guys can see. I think that's good. Okay. Uh, so I'm using a put request. I'm hitting here the elastic search endpoint. And I'm just going to put a random name of an index because my goal is to create an index right now. In the SQL world, I'm making a table. That's the first thing you do. You want a table to store all your data. So that's what I'm doing. I'm creating an index. I'm going to call it test index. The way it's done is with a put request, name of your index, and that's really all there is to it. So let's uh, send this request. I'm going to click send and get a response. It's in JSON. Uh, acknowledged. True. This is the name of the index. So we officially made an index in uh, on our Elasticsearch. So that's pretty cool. Um, Next, the second request that I have prepared here, uh, we're going to create mapping, something called mappings to our index. And what do I mean by that? So you know how in SQL, for example, we specify that this particular field is type uh, text or type blob or, or type uh, character or whatever. Um, in Elasticsearch, we don't have to specify the mappings, but it is nice to do so because if we don't, Elasticsearch will guess what type of um, uh, what the type that this field should be. It can assign it a type string where you really want it to be like a number. Yeah, it's always a good practice to assign mappings first. And also in order to view the data in Discover, which is in Kibana, we're gonna get into that later, you would need to have at least one date type field. So we're gonna do that through our mapping. Um, um, mapping is again, it's a put request. Uh, the syntax is you would specify the index number that you would want to put your mappings on, basically specifying the types that this, uh, will, the H document inside the index will contain. And in a JSON, uh, body, um, you would just specify the types of the fields that you're interested in. So in our case, I want to set a timestamp. It's going to be type date. Uh, I'm going to. I want an age, an email, and a name. The age will be an integer. The email and name are going to be text. So this way, uh, Elasticsearch is going to know, store those as this type. So let's let's send the request and acknowledge true. So that's cool. So we officially have mappings in our new created index now. Uh, the next thing I want to do is confirm that the mappings works. And we can hit the same endpoint just with a get request instead of a put with an empty body to receive uh, the mappings that the index currently is using. So let's confirm that our mappings are set up properly. I clicked on send, and there it is. Those are the end. This is the mapping for our index. So as you can see, everything looks great. 
Okay. We can move on and actually uh, create some data for this table, aka index, to hold now, right? Uh, we would need to create a new document. So I'm going to use a post uh, request this time. And you can see how nice it is to interact with Elastic just through our API. It's very easy. Um, you spe uh, I'm specifying here the name of the index that I would like to create this document uh, for. And I'm going to hit the doc endpoint. I can also specify an ID for the doc if I like, but I'm not going to do that because I want Elasticsearch to automatically assign a, an ID for my uh, document. In the body, of course, you'll put your actual data for your document to hold. So you see timestamp, name, age, and email, like our mapping uh, is expecting. Um, this is in milliseconds. This is actually all I'll update it. I want this to be current. So a little website that I like to use for converting current time into milliseconds is this. I have it saved up here. It's a cool little website uh, just for the sake of our example. Uh, let's convert uh, human date to timestamp. There it is. I even have it in milliseconds and it's ready to go for me. So I'm just going to copy this. I'll exit this website. Go back to Postman, close my little notes here, and I'll copy this timestamp that should be the current time in milliseconds. All right, so we're ready to create this uh, document. Let's click send, make the post request. We get some messages back. So, where was this uh, document created on this index? This is the unique ID that was generated for us since we didn't specify one. Uh, results created, it was successful, everything looks great. In fact, let's go back to our browser real quick and just hit this, the, the, the index name, first of all, we have to specify. I want to view the document in here. So just to prove that like you can, you can use any HTTP client that you want. So uh, we called it, uh, I believe, test index, and I'm going to hit the search endpoint. Again, our browser is just making a GET request. And there it is. We can see here um, our document. It's inside our index. So very cool. We created a document. Um, awesome. While we're at it, let's create another um, and uh, I made a little example to show that you can search and get the index here. And the same thing from our browser, get request to our search endpoint. Here it is. All right. So uh, if we're already here, um, if we're already here, uh, let's also create the index that our honeypot example is going to be using since we are going to actually um, be using this, this index. Let's call, uh, let's create a new index. Let's call it honeypot this time. It's again a put request with the honeypot name, name of our index. Let's create. There it is. We created a honeypot index. Let's add the mappings again. I'm not going to add every field that we're going to be logging, but I do want to add uh, a date field so we can make this uh, viewable on Kibana later on. So you'll see why uh, when we get to that, to that uh, Kibana part. So I'm going to specify that uh, it's going to have a timestamp called date. And again, I'm making a put request to the mapping endpoint. There it is. We have our mappings. All right. So this is the basics uh, that we're going to be looking at with Elastic. Let's go back to our slides. And next, I would like to talk about the fake honeypot that we're going to be setting up. All right. So uh, that's that's the one that we looked at on the Docker and Compose, the Nginx and the, fly, and the PHP FPM. Again, you can use whichever framework uh, you like for your web server. So we previously set up a simple web server using our Docker Compose um, uh, file. Uh, this web uh, this web server is going to act as our honeypot. The honeypot is going to generate some logs for us to use, so we can feed those into our Elk uh, pipeline. We're going to mimic an attacker um, and make some malicious requests uh, to our web server in the hopes of infecting it. Our web server, also known as our honeypot, will log all the incoming requests as logs, which we will then analyze uh, with our Elk stack. So 
this is what we're going to be using uh, engine x for and yeah so um before i talk about rabbit mq and celery i actually want to briefly show you the code uh just a snippet of how the honeypot is going to work it's very simple uh let me go to adam real quick there it is let's go to honeypot and index php all requests are going to be forwarded by nginx into this little function right here on any route all we're doing is right here receiving the request logging it and then sending it off right here to our uh, rabbit mq so very simple um we'll, we'll take a look at that soon uh, again once we start talking about rabbit mq um so yeah let's go back to our slides slides rabbit mq and uh celery so first of all, after you saw the code you saw uh, in on our honeypot, uh, you might be wondering why are we even using RabbitMQ? Why are we sending those logs from our honeypot to our RabbitMQ rather than, than uh, just sending the logs straight from our honeypot to Elasticsearch directly using HTTP? Um, uh, well, you definitely can uh, send the logs directly to Elasticsearch and not use RabbitMQ. Uh, but the benefit of uh, sending the logs to RabbitMQ first uh, is that RabbitMQ can act as a buffer. Um, so let's say that your uh, web server is under a lot of load and maybe even uh, crashes. Um, these logs are going to stay in RabbitMQ and won't be lost. Also, you can consume from RabbitMQ at your own pace using multiple uh, Celery workers. Uh, the Celery workers, uh, like I said before, uh, can then auto scale the number of workers that they're going to be using at any given point based on the load. Uh, so this way, you have great control over the consumption rate and handling large bursts uh, of incoming uh, requests. So let's say some attacker is spamming our honeypot with like a bunch of metasploits attempts. Um, it might be a lot uh, for us to just send off like that to Elastic. Uh, it's, it's better to have a middleman to manage all that for us. It takes a lot of load of our actual honeypot. It takes a lot of load off of it. Um, so um yeah uh so uh it really helps our system scale basically um in the rabbit mq and celery setup um we can also basically treat each log as its own task and track each individual task using the celery flower uh web ui that i talked about i'm going to show it soon it's uh, super handy um uh, and, and another great thing is that uh, if a worker crashes in the middle of handling a task uh, it's not popped off the queue. So uh, another worker would just come come in and, and take that task. Uh, workers, uh, generally speaking, they should send an act back to RabbitMQ before getting rid of the task. So if it crashed, no act was received. Uh, technically, it should be picked up by a different worker. Uh, there's different settings you can play with in order to make that happen, but uh, it provides us a lot more, I guess, options to, to uh, in, into our pipeline. Um, Cool. So now let's show how it works. Uh, let's look at RabbitMQ. Uh, let's start off by looking at the RabbitMQ management tool. Uh, and let's create what's called an exchange and bind it to a queue. So the way RabbitMQ works, uh, which is, uh, again, a message broker, it's going to hold our queue. Um, it it's, it's kind of works in a way that um, it, it has like a uh, consumer and producer kind of like setup where the person the, the application sending the message is going to be the producer and the one reading the message will kind of act as your consumer so uh, let me expand on that a little bit more let's go to a rabbit mq um uh rabbit mq container we map the ports again from the container to the local host the password is guest guest it's specified on docker hub when you pull the image you can take a look there Let's log in and you see we have this awesome uh, web tool here that we can monitor um, our queues, our connections, channels. I'll, I'll get more into all that uh, soon, but uh, just the basics, the important part is that um, you, as a producer, you would publish messages uh, to an exchange. This exchange is then binded to some queues. It can be many queues. And it will just basically pass those messages to a queue, which your consumer is then grabbing, basically consuming. 
Um, that's really um, uh, what you need to know. Um, it's uh, it's 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 super fast. It's awesome. It can handle tons of messages in near real time. It's really powerful. So um, let's create uh, our first exchange. Are we gonna be that our honeypot? Sorry, yeah, our honeypot, aka web server, will uh, uh, publish messages too, right? So we can click here on add new exchange. We'll call it honeypot right there. We can play with the settings. There's tons of things you can do. It's very powerful, but let's just keep it simple for now. Let's just create a basic exchange. It's called honeypot add exchange. You can see here that I have a new exchange added. But this, ex uh, this exchange is not mapped. It's not binded to any queue right now. So let's go ahead and create a queue for it. We'll go to the queue tab here. Um, and we'll just create, uh, add a new queue. So let's do that. Let's call it Honeypot as well, just to keep things simple. You can see all the cool features, RX fire, messages, time to live, uh, durable, not durable, all kinds of stuff you can, you can do here, but let's keep it simple for now. We're going to add the queue. There it is, a new queue called Honeypot. Let's click on it. We can see here a nice visual of messages coming in and out, how, if they're ready to go, if they're not. We can even see how many consumers are consuming from the queue. It's currently zero, no consumers. But I want to take a look at this section called binding. So this is where we would bind um, our exchange to our queue. So let's do that right now. Um, let's add Let's uh, let's add the exchange that we want this queue to be binded to. We call the honeypot, if you remember. Let's add some routing key. It can be anything. Uh, I'm just going to use test key. That's going to bind our exchange to our queue. And click on bind. And just like that, every message that is going to hit our exchange will be forwarded to our queue. And we'll be able to consume it now uh, just like that. So let's test it out. Uh, let's, let's look at our queue um right here we see in our queue that we have zero messages right now nothing is coming in because nothing is currently publishing to this queue but if we actually hit our honeypot let's take a look at the code again real quick for our for our honeypot let's go to adam we see that we basically are gonna our, our every time we hit this this route uh we're gonna basically send this request into rabbitmq so uh, with the name to our exchange called Honeypot that we just created with the binding key that we just made. So it should it should technically work now if we go to Postman and hit this Honeypot. It should we should it should uh, create the messages for our RabbitMQ. Let's do that. Let's go to Postman. Uh, let's hit our fake Honeypot. And remember, our fake Honeypot is listening on localhost uh, five hundred one. And I'm not going to do anything fancy. It's just going to be a simple GET request, nothing else. And let's send. And there it is. We get a message back. Obviously, a real honeypot is not going to reply back request logged with a little smiley face. Um, but I wanted it to do that for us so we can see that everything is working properly. But uh, it should have logged the message and sent it off to our queue. So let, let's check it out. Going back to our RabbitMQ. We can already see we have one message ready here, 12, one messages. Nothing is incoming right now because it's already finished processing, but we do have a message in here and we can see the graphs. We have a ready message. Um, so that's cool. Uh, we still have no consumers. So this message will remain in here. So that's how you can kind of see that RabbitMQ can, can be a buffer. If for example, our consumer is currently down, um, but yeah, let's get our message. Let's see if it worked. Uh, we can even get our message straight from here. Just click on get message. This is the message that we got from our honeypot. It's everything we need to know about our request. Uh, there it is, a bunch of information about our request. So that's fantastic. Um, now what we need to do is create some sort of worker to consume this message from the queue and do stuff with it, um, aka maybe uh, it can add fields, remove some fields, put a special tag on it, and then it can just ship it off to Elastic for storage where we can query it and do all kinds of cool things with this data. Um, 
So yeah, um, I think we are ready to do that now. Let's consume this message using Celery. So let's go back to our slides. And this is the Celery slide. Um, yeah, we are going to create a Celery task and consume from that queue that we just made with our worker. I'm going to show how they can scale in numbers dynamically. And we're going to look at Flower to kind of monitor our workers. And you guys are going to see how, how awesome it is. So, um, and by the way, I got to give uh, Jonathan uh, all the credit here. He taught me everything I know about this entire system. So he's in here. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> uh so um yeah let's take a look at how we can do that uh let's go to adam real quick and look at the celery code it's very simple uh celery there it is so let's see what it takes to get celery up and running celery requires like i said a message worker in our case it is rabbit mq so you see when we create a new celery application we specify where is our broker and check this out. This is why I love Docker Compose because usually you would put here like an IP or uh, or some sort so, uh, some sort of a URL. But um, the problem with that is our RabbitMQ is running on a container. That IP might change very frequently. So automatically, uh, RabbitMQ because we um, automatically Docker Compose because we put uh, we used uh, Docker Compose and put all of our services on there. Every time we write RabbitMQ, which was the name of our container, check it out, the name of our container, it automatically translates that into the, IP, the current IP address that this container has. So really, really neat. Um, so as you can see, we specify the broker. You can also specify a backend. I'm using RabbitMQ as a backend as well. There's tons of backend available to store your results from the workers or the state that the workers are in. You can use Memcache, can use SQL can use uh, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, most likely, if you want to use some sort of a back end, uh, Celery supports it. So uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so this is just a function to send our, um, in the end, after we finish enriching the data that we got from the queue, uh, we'll use this function to send off the new all improved log into Elasticsearch. Uh, you can take a look here. It's very simple. It just makes a, a HTTP request and that's it. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much uh, the function that we want the worker to use on our data from Rabbit. So uh, the data from Rabbit is going to be inside of this uh, argument, uh, which is our request from our honeypot. I know it's a little, it's a little much, but uh, Try, try to uh, bear with me here. So, so the honey. This is a request from the honeypot that was uh, pushed into Rabbit, and then this uh, uh, salary worker is about is going to consume that message from Rabbit, and it's going to be in here in this argument. So, uh, we want to take uh, this request. We want to add stuff to it. In my case, I want my salary worker to add a a um, timestamp. I wanted to add more fields. I wanted to randomize the port just so we can have nice some, something nice to look at in Kibana later on, um, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so let's let's do that. I want to set the queue from the salary test queue that I'm using to the new one that we made called Honeypot. I'm gonna give it the binding key that it needs. I'm gonna save, and then I'm just gonna restart that specific container using my little tool here. So let's restart Celery. So let's go into the logs here. We start Celery. I can also do that from the command line if I want to, uh, but this should uh, restart it. Should take like a second. I'll make sure that I clicked it. There it is. All right, Celery should be restarted. There it is. We see some logs. It's updating. There it is. It should now be using the new Honeypot queue um, that we made with the right binding key. And if we go to our Rabbit MQ now. Rabbit MQ, which is right here, we should see zero messages. So remember, that there was a, there was one message here, but now that we have a consumer, it consumed that message. So let's take a look. Um, yeah, zero messages, and if we go to the consumer, we can see that we have now one consumer. So the salary worker is officially consuming from our queue. This is fantastic. We can make uh, we can hit the honeypot, have it send off to Rabbit. And our celery is going to pick that up 
and um, add stuff to it and send it right to Elastic. So uh, you might be wondering, uh, let me go back to Adam here. Uh, this is the code for our honeypot. So honeypot uh, index.php, there it is. So you might be wondering, okay, how did Celery know to run that specific function on the data? There can be many functions, right? So if you want Celery to work with RabbitMQ and, and work correctly like that, you can push uh, data to RabbitMQ in any format that you like. But if you want Celery to understand that format, you need to uh, follow this, this little format. You need to specify an ID for your task in your message and the name of the function, in our case, it's called enrich data. It's a function that exists in Celery that we just looked at uh, that you want the worker to use on this message. So that's how he knows um, about running that specific function. So that's cool. Um, let's go back to our Celery here. You see what, what we're doing here after we finish enriching the data. We're just sending it to Elastic. So Elastic should now have our request. In, uh, in, in an index that we previously created called Honeypot. If you remember uh, Postman right here, we created our, um, with this right here, we created the Honeypot index. So that's where we send it off to uh, because, um, and the reason for that is because we specified that index um, here. Well, I should have uncommented it, but we should have specified it here. And now any additional requests will, will be sent to this index honeypot. You see that this is the URL that we're hitting. Honeypot will be here. Um, so yeah, so that's pretty cool. Uh, another thing about Celery, I want to show you like the scaling capabilities. Uh, I have a script here called uh, setup, right? Um, setup worker, there it is. And look at that, uh, this is what it's doing just uh, from the command, uh, it's just a command line. Uh, it can work on the command line as well. You can just type Celery in that command, it will work. Uh, I, I have a script that does that here, but basically we can specify here out of scale. We're saying basically uh, you can bring it up or down between 10 and three workers based on the scale. It's up to you based on usage. So you wanna use a lot of burst of loads, uh, create like a couple more workers to handle that. Uh, if there's no load, we don't need to have them all uh, running, uh, bring them down. So it's, it's, it's really, really awesome. All right, next, uh, let's go back to our slides. I'm gonna bring this all together very soon. It's gonna be really cool once we can look at all this in Kibana. So, um, all right, cool. Uh, next, uh, we are going to look at this. Uh, in Kibana. So just a little bit about what Kibana is. We talked about the front end tool, a bit of information. Um, um, Kibana uh, comes with a, a lot of features. Uh, it makes analyzing the data actually much easier if you just have tons of it. Uh, you can create your own dashboards there. We're going to do that. Uh, graphs, all that kind of stuff, we'll do that. So let's jump right into it, actually, because I think I'm running out of time here a little bit. So let's, let's jump right into this. Uh, we have Kibana on our local host. It's mapped in here. It's gonna be very, it's gonna be like this at first. I, I, I like the dark mode. So I'm going to uh, just change that real quickly. Uh, uh, settings, advanced settings here. Uh, just so I don't burn your eyes out. Uh, dark mode, let's enable that real quick, save and reload and that's it it should work okay cool much better all right awesome so uh kibana this is kibana this is how it looks like it allows us to search our our um our indexes um it has many cool features there's also the dev tools here which is cool you can make the same http request you can make put get post you can interact with it from here uh, with your elastic uh, cluster it's very convenient if you don't want to mess with stuff like uh, authentication and all that kind of stuff. It's right here uh, on the same, uh, it's, it's, I use it a lot, as you can see, it's pretty cool. Um, so um, what I want to do now, I want to create something called an index pattern. 
because we want to be able to actually view our data in our index in Discover, and we can't do that without without an index pattern. Uh, what is an index pattern? I'm just going to go to here, uh, create a new index pattern under our um, index pattern right here. There it is. Why is an index pattern? All it is, it's a regex uh, uh, where you can specify which indexes you want to include uh, in, uh, you want to basically look at. So um, if we want to look at that test, that test um, regex that we had, uh, uh, the text index that we had previously, you see this is already matching uh, the, the index right here. So I'm actually going to put the full name though. There it is. Uh, you will click next, and then uh, you would. Uh, the reason we added timestamp is because Discover needs a timestamp so we can know how to order the data. So uh, we're gonna tell it to use timestamp as the date field. We're gonna create this index pattern. So we uh, officially created this index pattern, and look at that. It has a little clock here next to the timestamp, so it's gonna be uh, uh, using that as our date. Um, so that's pretty cool. Another thing you can do in here is with index management, you see we have our indexes here. You can look at how many documents you currently have in there. You can see the health status of, of, of it. Mine is yellow because it's running on local host. Uh, but if you click on it, you can take a look at the mappings that we set up on, uh, previously. Uh, you can edit, uh, you can delete the index. You can do a lot of things from here. It's very convenient. Let's go to discover. Now that we have an index pattern, we're gonna use that index pattern. You see, and uh, let's uh, see if we can, you can play around with like uh, how, how, how many, how much data you want to see from where, what time frame. There's a lot of options here. Let me just get rid of this. Okay. There's a lot of options here. Uh, let's, let's, let's look at all the data. Let's look at years worth of data. We only have one document, but like you can also do that. Um, this is a document that we previously inserted. Uh, check this out. You see the age, the email. If you expand it, you can fully see it. You can see it in JSON. It's pretty cool. But we want to actually see the the honeypot uh, logs, right? Let's just uh, quickly um, um, let's just quickly uh, insert more data into a honeypot. Let me go to the slide real quick. Let's put it all together now. Uh, wrong slide. All right. Let's put it all together now um and insert some more entries into our honeypot let's hit our honeypot um the way i'm gonna do it i'm gonna i, I made a little uh, shell script uh that makes a bunch of malicious requests to our honeypot because i want to have a lot of data in there for us to play around with um, um basically we're gonna run this shell script it's gonna make a bunch of requests to our honeypot uh and we're gonna be able to 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 look at that all right so um, am I doing on time? Yeah, I'm okay on time. All right. So um, uh, let me quickly show you the script. This is the spam request that sh that I made. Nothing fancy. I wonder. I want it to be kind of randomized. I want to put a few different requests for us to look at. It's just a bunch of like uh, requests that would mimic an injection. W get requests. Uh, some noise all kind of stuff. Um, it takes an argument to how many requests we want to do. We'll do like 400 just to have a lot of data. Um, and yeah, so let, let, let's do that right now. Let's go to the terminal. Um, let's go to a terminal. Let's open this. Yeah, there it is. Let's clear this. Um, let me go to the right directory. There it is. Uh, in my presentation folder and yeah spam request at sh let's just run that spam request at sh i'm gonna put like 400 requests that we'll make hopefully everything works great see making a bunch of requests this is our honeypot responding request log request log let's actually see this uh Let's actually look at Rabbit and Q real quick. You see, we, we should be getting a bunch of uh, of hits on there. So, uh, is it already done? 
I think it's consuming them so fast that we can't really see it. You see, like, uh, the, the incoming speed, uh, we can't really see that it's ready. It's consuming it so fast that we can't even see it. Um, another thing, as we wait for all this request to finish, I want to show you flower, the celery flower. So, uh, it's on local host for us. We mapped it to port 5555. Uh, there it is. And this is it. This is cool because, um, check this out. Um, this is basically, well, Everything's failed. We're gonna see why. But this is a good thing uh, because uh, now I know that everything failed. It's easy for me to look at through uh, celery. It's showing me all of the tasks that the workers are running. You see that we um, um, processed 400, failed 400, and we'll be able to see why. Uh, we'll go to tasks. Let's order them by timestamp. If I click on one. There's a lot of cool features. We can see actual errors. Uh, yeah, I need to comment this. It's not, I, I forgot to uncomment this. It's a very simple fix. We'll do that right now. But look how cool this is. We actually have uh, visibility into where it failed, why it failed, um, uh, the arguments, uh, how long it took. You see runtime, received, started. It's, it gives us a lot of visibility into our pipeline. Let me just fix that, that little error here so we can get going. Um, there it is. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is the index right here. Let me save that. Uh, and let me restart so we can send it to the right index. Okay. Everything looks good to me. Let's restart Celery. All right. Celery is right here. We'll click. We'll start it. So the salary test is not the time. We can see errors in here as well, which is awesome. Uh, that should fix everything. We don't have salary tests anywhere. Let me make sure. Yeah, it's all coming to the app. Like, we're good. Okay. Did salary start? I think it did. Let me just make sure. Let me restart again. Okay. Uh, we should be good. Uh, now everything is up and running. There we go. We set a little restart uh, orange going back to uh, yellow. Let me do this and let's run our script again. Let's spam our honeypot with a bunch of malicious requests once again. All right. Let's take a look at celery. Uh, unlucky. Uh, no, actually, it, it it's fine. Uh, it did work. Uh, I'm just I just have it set up weird like that. All right, last last chance uh, for this. Uh, let me restart celery real quick. Um, celery. Sorry about that, guys. This is how demos are. All right, let me stop it. Make sure it completely stops. And I'll restart it. All right, we exited, running, stop it. We'll take a second here, and we're ready to go. All right. It stopped. Now let's start it. There it is. We'll give it a second, and we will make requests again. Let's see. Uh, all right, we'll give it a second. Are we ready? It is. Let's do it. Let's spam our honeypot. I'll see my fingers here. Let's hope that it works. And we got a bunch of success uh, messages. There it is. Celery was able to pick up each individual log from RabbitMQ, enrich it, appends a bunch of fields to it, ports, and was able to send it off to Elasticsearch. So, uh, now that we have our data supposedly into our Elasticsearch, we need to make another uh, pattern index to search the honeypot index that we insert all that into. So let's create an index, uh, index pattern. Uh, we'll call it honeypot as well. Honeypot. All right, awesome. And we'll create. Uh, we'll choose timestamp. Remember, we said the mapping before. We have a timestamp field. And in fact, our celery worker enriches the data uh, by 
adding that function, updating it. So uh, create an index pattern. There we go. It's ready. We are ready to search Kibana. Let's go to the honeypot. Let's hope all our love are in here, and they are. Awesome. Okay. So we have a bunch of malicious logs from our honeypot. Okay. So um, Kibana, like I said, it's awesome. Here, let's take a look at all the fields of the request that we're able to get. Content length, all that type of stuff. Port, path, any types of... Uh, uh, everything that our server was able to get from that request is in here. This is just noise uh, that I put in, but check this out, for example. This is supposed to supposedly uh, a malicious request. Uh, example, WordPress plugin vulnerable. And let's take a, a look here. We see that the body rise that we get some malicious.com. So some attempt to inject um, uh, we can do some cool search queries on this data. Imagine there's like millions of documents in here, like tons of documents. You're not going to go one by one. You want to see, hey, where were, where are all of my injection attempts? Or you, so, so you, you would say search wget. Is anybody trying to use wget inside the request to inject stuff? Have us download stuff. Yeah. We see we have a bunch of documents that will get that. This is all of the injections attempts. Uh, to make this nicer to look at, let's add some fields. Uh, we, I'm just interested in the timestamp. Um, I want to see. Uh, I want to see the body raw. I want to see some. Uh, I want to see the URL. Uh, I can see the user agent, the port. Uh, so yeah, that's nicer to look at. I can also say, hey, uh, inside the URL field, uh, was there? MEW get so only in the URL, not in the body row. And there it is. Uh, on a specific port, maybe I can say and uh, port equals to like 500. Or, you know, it makes analyzing the data much, uh, much easier. Uh, so, uh, all right. Uh, so, yeah, um, another cool thing uh, with Kibana is, of course, dashboards. Uh, uh, usually, when you make a front end for this type of data, you, uh, usually it ha it's going to have very similar features all the time. Uh, you can spend a lot of time creating your front end, but Kibana is ready to go. It will most likely have anything you need and more, honestly. So rather than spending months developing something, you can just use this. It's fantastic. It's very uh, customizable. So let me just show you real quick. Let me go to the visual uh, uh, tab here. So you see, I can create my first uh, visual. And if I go back to my code very quickly uh, for a moment with uh, Celery, I see that I'm adding a random fake port for us to use. I'm interested in making like a pie chart. I want to see popular ports. I want to see what are the current trends, who is hitting what, what services. If somebody hit port, some random port like 7006, and there's a bunch of requests to it, it's probably like a vulnerable version of something using that port. I want to find out. So uh, let, let's make a little visual uh, to easily be able to see that and share that uh, with others. Um, so you can create a new visual, click on that. Uh, look at all the options, there's tons of options. You can make heat maps, charts, line graphs, it just, uh, you, you, you will have to play around with this. Uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of options here, uh, but I'm gonna make a pie chart uh, right now. It tells you which index pattern to use, aka which data do you want into this pie chart. You can specify, uh, you know, you can be very creative with this. Uh, we're going to use the honeypot stuff. Uh, you see, I get like a random donut right now. You can also specify the range again in here as well. I'm going to use 15 years worth of data just because I can, because I have very little amount of data in here. Uh, I have like 400, we put 400 entries. So, um, yeah, you can start playing with it. So, let me show you. Um, Let's add here uh, a, a bucket. A bucket is like aggregation of data. Um, we'll split the slice here. Um, we'll choose a term. We'll choose a, a term that we want to uh, display here. And the term I'm looking for is something that Celery added for me while enriching the data. Uh, we call it the fake port, right? Yeah, there it is, fake port. OK, and look at that. That's, that. That was super easy. You see all the popular ports here. 
Uh, there's more though that I can I can do here. There's, there's a lot more that I can do here, but I'm gonna keep it simple. I do want to show labels though. Let, let's let's do that. So that looks cool. All right. So you can see that like to, uh, eighteen point seventy one percent of my malicious hits were on port twenty three. Uh, yeah, you can click on it. You can do that. And if I change, by the way, let me add a, a little bit. Uh, all right, I'll do that later. But I want to show you this first. Uh, in order to add this to a dashboard, for example, I am going to save this visual. Let's call it our pie. All right, it's a, it's a donut in this case, but I don't feel like typing that donut. <laughs> it's called a pie. Uh, confirm save. Okay, now this is saved. We can also share this very easily with other people. Permalinks. You can even shorten the URL. It's pretty cool, but we're not going to share this just yet. We're going to put this in a dashboard, put more visuals on the dashboard as well, and share the entire dashboard. So let's do that. Let's let's create another visual. Uh, we have a pie chart right here. Let's create another one. Let's just create, um, I don't know, uh, there's, there's many options here. Let's create a metric uh, on the same data. Uh, you see we have 800. Um, 800 logs in this index. Let's just let's just take that for a second time. Let's not mess with it too much. Let's just keep that like that. I'll save this one as well. We will call this a count, a log count, right? Log uh, count. There it is. And let's make one last visual just just for fun. Uh, let's 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 put some text. Let's. Uh, this is a cool title all right or uh, yeah well actually let's 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 say uh this these are uh popular ports all right makes sense you can play with the size here uh all kind of stuff let's do that this is just a, just a quick little title save i'm gonna call it port title all right confirm save let's bring this all together now all these visuals onto a dashboard. Let's create a new dashboard. I clicked on this little dashboard icon. Create new dashboard. All right. Um, and yeah, let's add. You see, you can you can add here visuals. And I have all these visuals I can add. Let's start with the title. So let's add all of this. Uh, in fact, uh, that's it. Uh, let's add. I, I made a nice dashboard. So you can play around with the placing, with the size. You can move this around. You can You can do whatever you want in here. Um, in my visual, I just put five. Uh, let, let's uh, let me let me show you something real quick. Uh, let's go back to our pie chart. All right, uh, pie chart. In my query here, I put five. I didn't realize I want to show everything. So let's put a max of five or hundred popular ports to show, and click play. There it is. Now I can see all the ports I'm actually using. All right, let's go back to our dashboard. Uh, Cool. Uh, let's delete. Let's add. Did I save that? That I don't think I saved it. That's why. Okay. So again, real quick. All right. Let's uh, let's save. Save. Confirm save. There it is. It should actually update automatically here. I make changes. Uh, oh, I didn't save my dashboard. Okay. Let's start over. Dashboard. Add. I want to add everything, all right? Everything is added. Uh, that's cool. I want the title to kind of be um, here instead of instead of there. Uh, see, it automatically puts it down. And let's replace that. Uh, let's make this smaller. So you see, you can really customize this with a bunch of heat maps, and you can append uh, visuals together. It's really really cool count and the fun thing is if i add more data so check this out let's 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 hit our honeypot again if i add more data this is going to uh, change look at that it's going to take into account how many counts you see that count down there changing popular port ports so uh this this is awesome you can then uh share this with anyone that has access to kibana of course you can configure users and permissions all that good stuff but there it is. Um, just to wrap it up, I um, uh, there it is. Uh, there's, there's obviously a lot more that you can do. Uh, Elasticsearch is awesome. You can look at the, if I had like a full cluster, I don't, it's just a little demo. If I had a full cluster with a bunch of nodes, I can look at their health status. I can 
see which ones are up or down. I can I can look at uh, the rate of request that clients are actually hitting our Elasticsearch uh, rules. I, there's tons of things you can do. It's very powerful. It's open source. It's uh, it's incredible. So um, yeah, that's that's really the main features. Um, you're gonna find yourself using this a lot. The Dev Tools. I can't stress that enough. It's it's really it's really convenient to just write. Uh, your your request to the, to this to the elastic and you see them right here. That's awesome as well. Um, and uh, and yeah. Uh, so just to just to recap to summarize, um, we have our honeypot. We're making requests to it. Uh, let's actually look at our Docker controls. That, that's a good. Uh, all right, cool. So just to recap, we have our honeypot. We're making some malicious requests to it using a script. Pretend for a second that this is like Metasploit or anything hitting your honeypot instead of my little script. Um, uh, and then uh, that honeypot automatically pushes all those logs that it receives uh, to the Rabbit MQ, where the salary workers consume from that queue, manipulate the data in some sort of way push it to Elastic, and then you as the researcher or the analyzer would, would have this awesome Kibana tool that you can just quickly filter out finding cool information in your data if it's massive. You see, I was able to just find injections from the URL if I'm looking for a specific CVE or something. Um, uh, you'll be, you can store PCAPs, and you can, you, can do, you can get very creative with this. It's a very helpful tool. So that's really the recap. Um, that's it for me. Uh, this is the introduction to Elk. Uh, I hope uh, this was beneficial uh, to you in some sort of way. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I know this was long. There was a lot of services. It hard, it's a little hard to follow, so I appreciate your patience. And thank you uh, very much. And special thank you to Jonathan again. Taught me everything I know. He's an, he's an Elasticsearch ninja. So um, thank you to you, Jonathan, as well. All right, and that's it for me. Uh, you can take it away, uh, 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 Rod. Uh, thank you very much. Unless, uh, of course, uh, oh, we have some questions and stuff. Uh, Great job, Avatar. If there's any questions that we... Uh, anyone want to type in the chat? One second, Webex is giving me some issues. All right. How does this type of setup compare to a general, in general, to Splunk setup? Uh, one second so you want to go over the difference a uh, little bit of, about what splunk compared to elastic i know splunk is not open it, it is free for up to a certain amount of ingested data and searchable data and then you have to pay for it or elastic you're mostly paying if you're paying for enterprise uh licenses it's mostly for not on the actual amount of data but more the additional features that you could do to the data, like uh, AI and SSO integration and stuff. I don't know what features are unlocked with uh, paid services for Splunk. Was that a question for me, Jonathan? Well, there's a question in the channel about how does it compare in general to Splunk, uh, Splunk setup. I know Splunk is probably a little bit more of a turnkey installa installation. I don't know how the installation of Splunk is. Oh, it's easier. Splunk is way easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it costs more though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I had some uh, WebEx issues. Um, is there any questions? Yes, they, yeah. if you can, if you want to answer that question too, uh, how what does the, the setup compares with uh, Splunk? 
Oh, I see. Uh, to be honest, I'm not too familiar with Splunk, so I, I apologize. Uh, if anybody else knows the answer to that, um, feel free to jump in and answer that. Uh, I can I can go ahead. Awesome. If, yeah. Uh, so Splunk is easy to set up. Uh, it's just the same similar concepts with the uh, how you do it with the uh, win log beats and go to the log stash and directly go to the elastic search and stuff that you cut up the middle ground process uh, where you go from uh, their forwarders which you have to install on the assets and then it goes to directly to Splunk uh, 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 the, the backend database of them uh, so the good part about Splunk is there are many features which you don't have in elastic search uh, like you know joining tables and uh, uh, pivoting through one data source to other data source, uh, uh, where Elastic lacks a little bit on that, but you can you can compensate that with a new Elastic search with uh, drill downs and all, uh, drill down dashboards which they have newly uh, introduced in 7.10 version, I guess. So uh, yeah, that uh, that that still uh, uh, is there. That point is there where Elastic is kindly. Uh, uh, a little bit behind the uh, Splunk usage wise. Uh, setup wise, it's easy, uh, but still, uh, if you don't know how to, what logs you're ingesting, and if Splunk doesn't know how to parse those logs, then you have to perform uh, uh, regular expressions in the Splunk and split the data out to different, da different uh, uh, data types, uh, which creates an overhead on Splunk and uh, will reduce your search speed. So, I hope that helps. Yeah, that's that's very, that's very accurate. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, I'd like to thank Ebiatar for his time and uh, and this excellent presentation. And um, I believe uh, somebody wants to download your demo. Do you have a GitHub or somewhere where? Oh, cool. Uh, currently, I don't, but I can, I can push it to GitHub. I can put it on Discord. Okay. Uh, okay. We can share it in um, the Slack and Discord. We put the Discord invite and uh, stay tuned. We will be announcing our, our uh, next meeting, probably the last one of the year. So stay, um, stay safe. Thanks again to Evitar, and I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for having me. Oh, one thing, uh, 